Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's been uh, rather an odd day here in uh, Southern uh, California, not by East Coast or Midwest standards, but for us, uh, snow and hail is rather unusual in Pasadena. And there's even been a bit of that here in Santa Barbara, where I am currently. So I am Tom Prince, Bowen Professor of Physics at Caltech and Director of the WM Keck Institute for Space Studies. As most of you already know, uh, the Keck Institute uh, is a think tank uh, for new ideas about space science and technology. And we work together with Caltech's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory to bring together the best scientists and engineers from around the world in the US uh, to participate in our Think Tank studies. We are very grateful to the WM Keck Foundation for their past support of the Institute. And we are also very grateful to the Caltech Space Innovation Council and other friends of Caltech for their continued uh, generous support of the Institute. One of our goals uh, at the Keck Institute is to help develop the next generation of space scientists and engineers. And among our activities is a program that we call the Affiliates Program, uh, which is a group of Caltech graduate students and postdocs who are interested in space science and engineering. And this uh, series of lectures is really their series of lectures. So I'd like to now introduce one of the leads of the uh, Affiliates Group. Uh, uh, who many of you will have met uh, in an earlier Keck Institute uh, webinar. Uh, that's uh, Nidika uh, Yadlapali. Nidika is a third year astronomy graduate student working with Professor Vikram Ravi. Her research interests uh, are in radio instrumentation and she is currently working on commissioning a new instrument called Sprite at the Owens Valley Radio uh, Observatory. Outside of research, she's currently the president of Caltech's Women in Physics, Math and Astronomy group. And in her free time, she enjoys hiking, rock climbing, and baking. So here's Nitika, who will be your host for the rest of the evening. Nitika, uh, over to you. Hey, thanks, Tom, for the introduction. And it's good to see everybody attending our lecture tonight. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Evgenia Shkolnik. Professor Skolnick received her PhD at the University of British Columbia in 2004. Following her PhD, she worked as a postdoc at the University of Hawaii and continued on to be a Carnegie Fellow at the Carnegie Institute's Department of Terrestrial Magnetism in Washington, DC. In 2011, she joined Lowell Observatory as an assistant astronomer. And in 2015, she joined the faculty at the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University as an associate professor of astrophysics. In her career, Professor Skolnick has pioneered a number of notable science programs in the field of exoplanets. In her career as a postdoc, she conducted a survey to identify all nearby low mass stars called M dwarves. And later she began the HAZMAT program, which uses ultraviolet observations taken with NASA's GALAX satellite to study atmospheres of M dwarves and predict their evolution of their planet's atmospheres. She's also the principal investigator for a CUBE satellite mission called SPARKS, which will monitor M dwarves at ultraviolet wavelengths using cutting edge UV detector technology being developed in collaboration with JPL. Aside from her many impactful scientific contributions, Professor Skolnik also prioritizes mentorship in her career. In 2009, she and three other scientists founded a peer mentorship group called Goals and Problem Solving for Scientists, or GPS for short, and this has helped her and her colleagues navigate professional challenges such as imposter syndrome, job interviews, bias and discrimination in the workplace, the two body problem and maternity leave. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Professor Skolnick to speak about her efforts towards finding the answer to a question we're all interested in, are we alone in the universe? And before we begin, I would just like to say that she'll be taking questions both in the middle and at the end of her talk. So please use the Q&A feature throughout the whole presentation and send in your questions. So Professor Skolnick, on to you. Super, thank you so much, Nidika, for that lovely introduction. Um, you reminded me of some things that happened long, long ago, so that's really great. First of all, I wanna say hi and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm sorry we can't all be in the same room, 
but at least we can all be together. Many of us from across the country and um, across the continent, and I myself am completely snowed in here in Flagstaff, Arizona. So had it been in person, I wouldn't have been able to come. So, um, so thank you, Zoom, <laughs> and for Keck for doing the Keck Institute for doing this online. So today I get to tell you about an often ignored but my favorite wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's not just some regular violet, it's the ultraviolet. And in particular, the ultraviolet view of exoplanets and their host stars. So to give you a visual of what I'm talking about, here's a real image in the ultraviolet taken of the sun using NASA's SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And it's taken, I picked this one because it's taken at the time of um, the transit of Venus, which is that dark dot over there. And it's certainly not the sun that you're probably most familiar with, but I want you to keep it in mind because this is the kind of imagery um, that we'll be thinking about when I'm talking about the UV radiation of other stars that host planets like our sun. Let's keep moving, here we go. Um, here's another beautiful, um, beautiful movie from SDO the Solar Dynamics Observatory, where they took multiple images of the sun over one full solar rotation. And you see here the optical on the right-hand side, the um, which is the familiar, right? It's the familiar way of looking at the sun. But then as you move to the left, we see the far ultraviolet image, the extreme ultraviolet image, and the soft X-ray. And what you should be noticing is that the sun looks nothing like you expected at these, at these shorter high energy wavelengths which uh, is pretty remarkable and a beautiful image that I love to share. Now to put the UV into the broader electromagnetic spectrum, here's the whole spectrum for you, um, where we have on the left-hand side, we have the very low energy uh, radio wavelengths that are very long, but very low energy. And on the other side, we have the very short wavelengths, um, but are very high energy. And down kind of near the middle there is that tiny range, which is the optical wavelength range, which is what we see. And the reason why I wanna really point out the ionizing radiation, these high energy ones, is because it's this high energy, these high energy photons that are um, ionizing and chemically modifying and helping evaporate the atmospheres of the exoplanets that we want to study. So it becomes very important to start studying this high energy wavelength range. Now to make sure that we're all on the same page with the jargon, um, I wanted to point out three wavelength regions within the UV, the ultraviolet, um, the near UV, which is the longest range, the longest wavelength range and the lowest energy of the ultraviolet, the far UV in the middle and the extreme UV. And later on, you'll see how they affect planetary atmospheres in different ways. Now the vast majority of exoplanet observations are done in the optical and infrared wavelengths and there's very good scientific reasons and practical reasons why that's the case. Um, but the ultraviolet has been neglected um, in part because there are not many ultraviolet space telescopes um, with which to observe and also stars tend to be much fainter in the ultraviolet so they're so harder to observe and frankly we just didn't know that much um, about the ultraviolet of stars and planets until relatively recently. So most of the observations of exoplanets, both from the detection standpoint and the characterization standpoint are done with what's called the transit method. So if you've been to any exoplanet talk in the past, I'm sure you've seen this before because it very clearly identifies or, or demonstrates the transit method, which is fairly straightforward, right? You're measuring the drop in flux from the star as the planet cuts in front of the disk and reduces some of the starlight. But we can use this not just for planet hunting, but we can also use it for planet characterization. And the transit method is in fact the most successful method I would say in characterizing the atmospheres of planets. So if you wanna understand what the chemical makeup is of your planet atmosphere, say water or methane or carbon dioxide, whatever it is, um, we can do this with the transit method. So essentially the atmosphere then is backlit by its host star and, um, and you can see the chemical fingerprints in the spectrum of the star. Okay, I hope that's straightforward. I can't see you all nodding in agreement. So, <laughs> so if you have a question about that, just put it into the question um, box and we will try and address it. So I'm gonna give you very briefly 
four facts from three decades of planet hunting that have resulted in over 4,000 confirmed planets. One is exoplanets are everywhere, which is an amazing result, actually. I mean, the textbooks have to be written, rewritten for this. So the Kepler mission showed us that on average, every star on our, in our galaxy has at least one exoplanet. So what that means is there are more exoplanets than there are stars in our one Milky Way galaxy. I mean, just knowing that, I think, if that's all you take home from today, that's amazing. That's it. You, <laughs> I'd be happy for that. Um, Secondly, they're extremely diverse. So the range of properties in exoplanets, say if you were looking on a mass radius plot, have a much broader parameter space than even our eight planets in our own solar system, which we would, if we were to discuss them all in detail, we would realize how very, we would know how very different they are in our solar system. And these are even more diverse than that. Of these 4,000 confirmed planets, roughly 20 are in the habitable zones. Um, and more coming down the line. And the habitable zone is this, um, this ring around a star where if all other conditions were right, liquid water could exist on the surface of the planet. And then if you work out the statistics based on the discoveries from Kepler and knowing something about the stellar distribution, the stellar mass distribution in our galaxy, it turns out that there are uh, 75 roughly, you know, plus or minus a factor of two or three, um, uh, 75 billion with a B habitable zone planets. So rocky planets in their habitable zones. I'm not saying that they're habitable. I'm saying they are potentially habitable and they're in their habitable zones. And all in these tend to um, orbit low mass stars. Low mass stars are stars that are smaller than the sun and cooler than the sun. So to get a sense of this habitable zone and how it changes with stellar type, here is a movie showing the sun in the middle here. And then if you go to a hotter star, I guess I spoke too slowly. Um, if you go to a hotter star, the habitable zone has to move outwards, right? Because you don't wanna to stay too close to the fire, you boil off all your water. And if you go to the cooler stars that are much cooler than the sun, you have to move your uh, habitable zone closer, right? To stay warm. Uh, so, that's essentially how the habitable zone changes. You're closer in for the cooler stars, further away. But it's these cooler stars that we're gonna be talking about um, quite a bit today because they dominate the galaxy. So 75% of all stars in our galaxy are these cooler stars, also known as M dwarfs, which also means that they're the dominant hosts of all planets and the dominant hosts of all habitable zone rocky planets. So if you don't care about them yet, we, we should start. Absolutely. So here's our sun, a familiar image. And here's just a, uh, a drawing. This is not an actual image of an M dwarf, but it would be something like this we imagine. And if we look at a plot of luminosity over mass um, relative to the sun, so here the sun is at one one, and you look at F, G, K, and M stars, how we classify stars, this whole red range is M stars. And Proxima Centauri, which is our nearest stellar neighbor, Right, you've probably heard of it. It also has a potentially rocky planet in its habitable zone, which you would expect now because statistics says they're everywhere, right? So of course there should be one next door. Well, Proxima Centauri is only 0.2% of the sun's luminosity and that means its habitable zone is much, much closer. And in that separation, it has an orbital period. So the equivalent of our year of uh, only 11 days. That's how close it is. Another advantage of these M stars, these low mass stars, is because the star is smaller, you get a deeper signal in the transit light curve. And so it's, it just turns out to be easier to detect. So it's easier to detect those planets and it's easier therefore to detect the atmospheres of those planets. And fundamentally, really, if you're caring about habitability, especially remote sensing of habitability, it's the planet's atmosphere that is the cornerstone of the habitability. So let's have another visual for us to really understand how different a habitable zone planet is around an M star than it is around a, a sun like ours. So here's an image I like to show of a solar eclipse. And now I've just, now imagine that you've scaled this down to the size of Proxima Centauri, so a smaller star. And you've then put a little earth sized planet at 10 stellar radii away. Right, so that's actually to scale with the Proxima Centauri system. So that planet now is in the habitable zone of that smaller star. And so it's very, very close. So now there's a whole new 
um, set of issues that that planet has to worry about that we here in our comfortable one astronomical unit distance don't have to worry about. One is atmospheric heating and escape by the, the extreme UV photons. The other is the photochemistries. Like I said, these highly ionizing photons can change the chemistry um, and photo dissociate the molecules that you might be looking for, which of course can affect the surface habitability. It even, you could even uh, strip the entire atmosphere in some, in some situations. And so that would certainly affect your surface life. And lastly, for those of us who care about detecting um, habitable and inhabited planets, we want to find out if these biosignatures, these um, biologically created gases in the atmosphere of the planet could have, have um, potentials for false positives and false negatives. And it turns out that the UV can produce both. By different chemical pathways, you can produce both a false positive signature and a false negative signature. So we really, really need to understand the ultraviolet. And here's just one example. Let's say you want to look for water in the atmosphere of a planet. Um, it may in fact be on the surface, but if you have the right UV conditions, you could photo dissociate the water completely um, or the oxygen and create ozone, which may be a false positive biosignature. Um, so here's, and here, for those of you who like to look at spectra, like I do, here is a, a model spectrum. It's a reflectance spectrum of a Earth-like planet orbiting different kinds of stars. So the Earth orbiting the sun would give you this black curve and the Earth, or the Earth orbiting an active M star, right, would give you a red curve here, but an inactive M star, the green curve. So what it's saying is, is that the exact same planet will give you a different spectrum and therefore you would deduce different water or ozone content based on the star's UV radiation. Simple as that. So star planet interactions provide the holistic view of exoplanets, their environments and their potential to host life. So today, now that we know so much about planet hunting, we are now in the process of planet hunting for the sake of planet characterization. That is a big part of the test mission that is currently flying and looking for planets around bright stars that we can then characterize with other means like transmission spectroscopy. So the big questions in today's exoplanet science world is how do planets form? How do planets evolve? And what are they made of? And of course, as Nitika told us, are we alone, right? Many people are curious about that. I certainly am as well. And it turns out that the ultraviolet data from the central star can provide critical information needed to answer all of these questions. So as Nitika told us, um, already mentioned, we started in order to do this, the HAZMAT program, which stands for the habitable zones and M-dwarf activity across time. And essentially what we did there is we looked at existing data from the GALAX mission, the Galaxy Evolution Explorer, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which um, left a spectacular um, archive for us to use in order to study these low mass stars. And then we also followed many of those up with far UV and near UV spectroscopy from HST. But really these were the two best ways to study M stars. And in fact, at the moment, the only really good ways to study M stars in the ultraviolet. I just wanna show you a couple of examples of the things that we've learned. One is we've learned that these M stars are very active in the UV. In fact, they're more active than we thought from optical data. So the UV energies are much, much greater and more flares are detected in the UV than in the optical. Here is a beautiful example from 2004 from Galax of a, of a M4 star GJ3685, if that means anything to any of you. Um, and you can see this double flare happening that increases by 10 UV magnitudes. That's an increase of about 9,000 in flux in just 200 seconds. And then in our own hazmat data um, with the HST far UV spectroscopy, we detected what we think is the strongest UV flare um, from an M star. And it also across, a across only 200 seconds, you can see in this light curve, increased by nearly a factor of 200 in just this one little narrow wavelength range. Okay, so these 
These M dwarfs are powerful, tiny, but they absolutely pack a good punch. Um, so, so here's a little bit of a complicated plot that I want to uh, want to walk you through. So bear with me. What it shows us is a flare frequency, what we call a flare frequency distribution, right? So the number of flares at what particular energy um, is emitted at that flare. And so even if, you, even if we don't get through all the details of this plot, which is a power law, or at least we seem to fit the power law, the most important point to show you here is that um, the has flare, which is that star over there, which is the, the flare I just showed you, happens every day. Right? We call it a super flare because it's stronger than any flare ever detected on the sun. And this flare happens every day on a young M star. And then we can use different um, flares that have been detected on old M stars and young M stars and compare them. And that's where the jagged lines, I'm sorry, I know you can't see my mouse, so I'm just gonna draw in the air. But the jagged lines um, are from data that we, can collect, that we have collected with HST. And what you see there is that the young stars are a hundred to a thousand times um, more energetic and frequent than, um, than the old M stars. So this is already telling us, giving us information of what are the conditions like for the exoplanets at the time that they're forming, right? And that's when they're having the primordial atmospheres. Does that mean that their primordial atmospheres have to be blown off uh, or probably are blown off? Um, who knows, right? Um, but people are working now that we have these numbers are working to find out probabilistically what young planets are exposed to around M stars. And here the green line is kind of a, is a, is a rough line of where sun-like stars would be. So you could see how the sun is thankfully, I guess is the answer, is, is, is thankfully is the word, um, less energetic with less with fewer frequent flares. However, we are really left with this missing bit here, right? I mean, we're talking about orders of magnitude from the has flare to where you might have a once per month flare or what's a once per year flare like? Does this power law turn over at some point? Um, so this is something that we are interested in looking into with the SPARKS mission and that uh, I will get to um, very shortly. Um, but in general, this is, this is the kind of thing that we need, not just from Sparks, but from all sorts of monitoring campaigns, the kinds of things that are difficult to do with flagship missions like the Hubble Space Telescope. So to remind us, this is the sun. Remember, the sun is not, um, this doesn't provide us with the strongest flares, but still it's a beautiful visual. We know that these low mass stars, also known as M stars, are more active than the sun. We want to know how active they are in the ultraviolet across planet formation and evolution time scales. And we want to measure these effects on the uh, these effects of the ultraviolet on the exoplanets themselves. Okay, so I've given you um, a little bit of an introduction as to why we might care about the UV, about some of the data we've been able to collect thus far, and some of the challenges we're going to try and solve with future instrumentation but I'm going to take a little break here, A, to relieve some of our Zoom fatigue and take some questions if there are any. Thanks, so yeah, we do have a couple of really good questions that came in through the Q&A. So let's see, the first question that we have is, when you define the habitable zone, do you take into account some probability that life can exist even in conditions that we consider hazardous? To first order, no. The habitable zone just takes into the distance, the temperature of the star and the distance of the planet. Um, that's a very simplistic view and there are many other factors that must go into it. So absolutely in no way does a habitable zone planet mean that it's habitable. And Thanks. the follow-up to this question was you, in your talk, you gave a number that there are approximately 75 billion habitable zones. Is that just for the Milky Way? Yes, there. that's just for the Milky Way. So now you can multiply that by the number of galaxies. Well, you, I mean, you get more complicated than that, right? Ages of galaxies, and there's a lot of work to be done there. So, um, but yes, that number was particularly for small planets in habitable zones around low mass stars. Yeah, that's really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the second question that we have is, doesn't the stars chemical makeup show up in the spectrum when you're looking for exoplanets and how do you disentangle the two? 
Yes, yes. The measurement that we're actually taking is a ratio of fluxes. And so you are essentially um, comparing the, star, the planet to the star all the time, but you also know what the star looks like on its own, right? So, um, so the star, the, the stellar signature is embedded, but you can take that out because you know what the star looks like when the planet is not transiting. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so those are some really great questions. I think we'll continue on to the talk now, but you know, everyone should please keep asking their questions in the Q&A and we'll get to some of them at the end. So back to you, Evgenia. All right, great. So now what we need are new UV eyes on the cosmos, right? We need, we need new UV space telescopes because Galax is no longer functioning, but we do have its lovely archive, but we cannot take, we cannot take more data with that. And we do have HST, which has, um, the time is shared with a thousand proposals every year um, and its UV capabilities are slowly fading away. And so here's a very kind of complicated but interesting plot that demonstrates that we are hitting up against what we call the UV gap, which is this right here. What it's showing you is in frequency or wavelength space on the x-axis and time of different missions on the y-axis. And what you see by this purple arrow that I'm trying to demonstrate is that now in the 2020s and the 2030s, so we're really talking about the next two decades, there are no um, guaranteed to be flying large UV space missions. So many of us who care about the UV, not just for exoplanets, not just for stars, but for a whole host of other scientific um, questions are really gonna get ourselves into some hot water. And so we really want to now fill this gap with smaller missions as we await, you know, potentially some large new flagship, um, which is shown at the top there. Um, if, we, if, 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 if a flagship comes out with some UV capability, which is not guaranteed either. Um, so, so what you've probably already noticed, because I've only been talking about Galax Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope, is that ultraviolet observations can only be done from space, right? So um, as you can see in this cartoon, we have the optical and some of the infrared and, and sort of near infrared that you could do from the ground. And of course the radio window um, also, but a bunch of the electromagnetic spectrum is not uh, observable from the ground. So we have to build space telescopes for that. So I'm gonna walk you through two that I'm currently working on. Um, the first is the Star Planet Activity Research CubeSat. And as the name tells you, it's a CubeSat. So it's very small, it's very tiny, and it's gonna be very dedicated. So it is just going to monitor in the far UV and the near UV, um, about 20 M stars, but each one of them for weeks to months at a time. So really filling in that gap of trying to catch the rarest and the strongest of flares. Um, now, so Sparks now is about halfway through development and we're hoping for launch sometime at the end of 2023-ish. Um, the second one is a brand new mission concept that we are developing with JPL um, for NASA's upcoming MIDEX call that's gonna be due at the end of this year. And it's called UV Scope the ultraviolet spectroscopic characterization of planets and their environments. I don't know about you, but I have a love-hate relationship with acronyms. So even though I love UV scope as just without an acronym, I felt compelled to provide one for <laughs> the rest of us. Um, so I'm gonna um, say also that building space missions, which I had no previous experience uh, or deep experience, I should say, prior to conceiving of Sparks, um, it really takes a team. And in this case, two teams. Um, here is a list of people, and if I'll give you a second to read through them. I'm sure there are some people here that you will absolutely recognize um, in, all of these, in all of these columns. We've got the science team, which helps us build the science goals, and also the science requirements, which we then use to design the instrument and the spacecraft. And so that brings us to the engineering and the implementa implementation team, which includes systems engineers and optical engineers and um, project managers. And it's just a, an amazing group. And then of course, we have to always be um, cognizant of our programmatic supporters, um, in this case at JPL and at NASA, who have been really supporting and funding these efforts. And so I'm eternally grateful for their faith in our projects. 
Um, so CubeSats, um, which were originally um, invented in the late 1990s to be just for education, to give students hands-on engineering experience, have started um, growing into becoming technology demonstrations. And now finally with increased capabilities are really starting to do amazing science. So now they do all three. And just to make sure that we all know what we're talking about with a CubeSat, CubeSats are a subset of small sats. So small sats are typically about hundred kilograms or smaller. CubeSats are much smaller. They come in these units called 1U, so 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cubes. And you can um, put them in these standardized form factors and stuff it with your favorite instrument and then hitchhike a ride into space, right? And, um, and, and do some really amazing science, in fact. And here is our, our Sparks postdoc, Dr. Tahina Rami Ramansola, um, showing um, a 3D model of the Sparks spacecraft and payload. Um, so this is not Sparks, not yet, but one day. Um, this is a movie of the very first astrophysics CubeSat launched in 2017, I believe. It's the Asteria CubeSat. It's also a 6U. It was internally funded um, by JPL and, the, and I believe also some funding from the Heisen Simons Foundation. And this is the PI was Sarah Seeger and the project scientist, Mary Knapp. But this is, the, this is the CubeSat being ejected from the International Space Station. So it's just amazing to have a video of something you've worked on for so many years, um, just sent off all, all on its own. Um, so for Sparks, even though we don't have a video like that yet, here are some, some numbers for those of you who like to see these kinds of charts with, with a snapshot of the mission. So we'll be a six U CubeSat. So like I showed you about this big, like you're, you know, at the size of your um, family size Cheerios box. It'll have a nine centimeter telescope. The plan is for it to be in a sun synchronous terminator orbit. So we can have uninterrupted observations of our stars. We're gonna observe simultaneously in the far UV and the near UV. And here are the two bands that are listed here if you wanna know exactly. And we'll have a fairly large field of view, 0.7 degrees. And what that means is there'll be lots of other UV variable things in the same, in the same field. So we could look at other M stars, we could look at G stars, we could look at active galactic nuclei. Um, there could be other things that people will be interested in monitoring programs. Our photometric requirements are one to 10%. And so those of you who work um, doing a lot of photo photometry are probably gonna say, those are, those are huge that, you know, that's not very good. <laughs> but the reality is, is we're looking at things that are changing by factors of two, five, 100, 2000. It's completely possible that we would see something that would increase by a factor of 10,000 if you extrapolate that curve down. So one to 10% is just fine. Um, and then we will stare at about 20 M stars with um, minutes precision or time cadence rather over at least one full stellar rotation and several weeks to a month per star. But really, the, in order to do this in a tiny package like a CubeSat, we do, have to, we do need some enabling technology to do this. And uh, Nick, <clears throat> excuse me, Nikki also already told us or mentioned that we were developing these, um, we're working with JPLers who are developing new detectors that are making um, UV possible from, from such a small package. So here I'm showing you the Galax quantum efficiency curves. And I'm getting a little technical here, but I know this technical people, I'm sure in the audience. Um, and these new detectors led by Shola Nixad's group at JPL are now gonna be five to seven times more sensitive. And that's really buying us some sensitivity going from the 50 centimeter telescope of Galax down to the nine centimeter telescope. And so here's the current fleet of funded or flying CubeSats that are doing astrophysics. Now there's lots of CubeSats doing earth observing. Um, there are CubeSats doing, looking at the sun. There's even CubeSats now being planned for the moon, but these are just the astrophysics ones. And uh, you see that there's a stereo, what I, which I'd already mentioned, and PeakSat was a French 3U CubeSat. And then the rest of us are all on the left side of this plot, right? We're all interested in the UV and X-ray um, for some of the reasons that I already mentioned, but really because we don't have that enough there, enough current capabilities for us to do time domain astronomy um, and monitoring campaigns. 
So that's why we're kind of, it's no coincidence that we're all shoved onto that side. But if any of you, especially um, the young folks in the audience are interested in small sats, there's a lot of opportunities and they're only growing right now. First of all, they're um, lower in cost. And of course, lower cost does mean higher risk, but it does also mean broader access to space. So more people are doing it, more countries are doing it. People who didn't have space programs or countries that didn't have space programs, um, universities who didn't have space programs can now get in on this. The faster build and cycle, the faster build times accelerates the technology development and the testing and it increases TRL levels, the technology readiness level, which is what you need to do in order to be the technology chosen for the flagships. You really need to have already been tested understandably so, on a smaller, higher risk mission and CubeSats and other small sats are perfect for that. Redundancy in small sats, constellations is really valuable. So if you, um, because they're not that expensive, maybe you wanna send five up at a time. And if one fails, your mission is not over. You can still continue with some of your science. The small sat opportunities are also great for training new mission leaders. And I don't mean just P new PIs, um, but there are mission leaders throughout the entire uh, program, right? That entire list that I showed you, everyone is fundamentally a leader on, especially in a small program. Lead systems engineers, instrument leads, um, deputy PIs, everyone has some leadership skills to gain. And this is one really great opportunity. Also, it enables new science. So this is, you know, why I got into the CubeSat world was because we had a fundamental science question that needed answering and there was no other way to do it other than to build your own dedicated CubeSat and stare at whatever you need to stare at. And so, um, so that's, I think the, that's what drew me into this CubeSat world. And also both scientifically and technologically, these small sats and CubeSats are pathfinders for the bigger missions that cannot tolerate as higher risk. They need to be low risk because they're so expensive and so capable. And so we can use what we learn from the small sats in, in, um, in new missions like explorer class missions, like the SMEX, the small explorers, the um, mid-ex mid explorers, and, um, and of course, future flagships. So that leads me to tell you some more about UV scope, which is exactly that. It was, it's a, it's a mid-ex concept, right? Where we are learning so much from what we are doing with Sparks from the detector development. Um, but of course, much, much more um, because we have different, a diff, we have different science questions now where we actually want to study the atmospheres of the planets themselves, not just the stars, but the, the atmospheres of these worlds. And so UV scope will observe a diverse range of exoplanetary systems. We'll have hot Jupiters and warm Jupiters and ocean worlds and, for, and also rocky planets and habitable zones. Um, and especially also the stars that are impacting these planets as well. And the strategy there is to directly probe the planet atmospheres through this technique this, that I talked earlier about, the um, transmission spectroscopy, which is the leading way by which we can study the chemistry and conditions of exoplanet atmospheres. So we will look at hundreds of exoplanets um, across um, not just M stars, but those that transit um, all sorts of stars, A, F, G, K, and M stars. And so since I can't stop looking at SDO movies, I'll show you another one because I love them so much, but it's essentially going to be doing this, where now, instead of transiting in the optical, we're going to be looking at transits in the UV. Um, and so this is, this is an actual movie of the transit of Venus. So now we wanna do this, but for exoplanets, which, uh, which I'm super excited about. So to give you a quick run through of the science questions UV scope will answer. We are of course, all about the UV, right? Because it's the UV is absorbed at different layers of the planet's atmosphere. So here I'm showing you a planet and I kind of drew out um, well, actually I didn't, my son actually made this for me. Um, he drew out three different layers of um, a planetary atmosphere. And in each one, the different energies or the different photons um, in the UV, remember I showed you the new, near UV, the far UV and the EUV, all absorb a different wavelengths and a different planetary atmospheres, pardon me. Um, and so this way we can then study how all these three wavelength ranges affect the exoplanet atmosphere by, di by directly looking at the atmosphere itself. So we will study the exosphere. This is the, the outermost region 
of the planet's atmosphere by looking at near UV and far UV transits and looking for escaping hydrogen, right? In order to, and, and metals in order to answer this fundamental question, how much mass is being lost to space across the full diverse planet population? Then we are gonna study the upper atmosphere of the planet also with the same technique, near UV and far UV transits, right? To answer this question, what roles do upper atmospheric properties play in escape processes, right? This is all part of what are the, what, what is the planet atmosphere made of? How is it evolving? How much mass it's losing and so on. And then of course, we also wanna study the lower atmosphere. Now the lower atmosphere is in fact the region that is well probed by optical and IR transmission spectroscopy. So we will not be looking for transit spectra of the lower atmosphere specifically, but because it's the high energy stellar radiation, primarily in the far UV and the near UV that affects the lower atmosphere, this is where we need to understand the chemistry and habitability um, of a planet by observing the star itself. Okay, this, so now we'll be monitoring the stars, the radiation environment in the near UV and the far UV, and then we are then able to predict the EUV. Unfortunately, it's very hard to observe in the extreme ultraviolet um, for stars, um, for the vast majority of exoplanetary systems because the gas, the interstellar gas absorbs much of these very high energy short wavelength photons. But we will be able to do this um, simultaneously. So how we're gonna do this um, is the plan is to build a 60 centimeter telescope that will feed a spectrograph. I know this, um, this is now for the engineers in the room who might be <laughs> particularly, and the astronomers who might be interested in what, a, um, what the actual output of UV scope would be. So it would be simultaneous observations from 1200 angstroms all the way to 4000 angstroms in order to get all these lines of interest. Um, we would be um, using these high quantum efficiency UV detectors developed at JPL. And we will collect many of these spectra as we monitor for days these exoplanetary systems. So in short, UV scope will be able to observe simultaneously the cause and effect of UV radiation in exoplanetary systems, something that we have good hints of from HST and GALAX data we need to know, but now we can do it all with one mission. So I wanna leave you with, some, with this idea as I spoke, started off with by saying that almost every, that on average, every star in our galaxy has an exoplanet. So when you look up at the night sky and you see all the stars out there, you can now just see them um, as not just stars, but as full stellar systems. And to take it even a step further, knowing that your vision in the optical is only a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum, you, know, you can then think about what would the sky look like at other wavelengths in the UV and elsewhere. So I'll leave you with that and happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. We had a lot of questions coming. So that was a really yeah. amazing talk. Um, so the first question we have here is, people would like to know, how does a CubeSat change and maintain its pointing after it's launched? Ah, um, a very clever design done by a company called Blue Canyon Technologies. They have a star tracker that fits into one U into your spacecraft. And so it only takes up one U of your six U or your 12 U or whatever you have and, and it helps you point. So that's, that's definitely, the pointing is not um, superb by say HST, by HST um, uh, standards, but we're aiming for like six arc second pointing and so that's good enough for what we need to do. Great. Um, the next question is, how close is the closest exoplanet to our solar system? That's a good one. The closest one is around Proxima Centauri, which is our closest stellar neighbor. And it is 4.3 light years away. Um, and it will forever be our closest exoplanet system because that's the closest star. And so it's, it's there. And um, if, if anyone ever thinks of sending, and I know people are thinking about how to send little cameras to Proxima Centauri B, which is what we call the planet, um, that will be the first planet we get to because it's the closest and, and, uh, and we get the most information from it the fastest. Really cool. 
Uh, the next question from our audience is, why do M stars flare more frequently than sun-like stars? And do M stars have solar cycles? Ooh, gosh. Okay, so why do they do? Well, they have typically um, much stronger magnetic fields. So the flaring is a, is a response to, um, to uh, tightly wound up magnetic fields on the star. So, and there's, I mean, there, there's more I could get into. If I had a whiteboard, um, I would love to draw something for you. Um, but the whole um, internal structure of the star is different. They have deeper convection zones. They have stronger magnetic fields. Um, so that's kind of, kind of an answer to the first question. And do they have um, solar cycles? We don't know for sure, in part because we have not been monitoring them for all, this, for all that long, right? We only um, have been kind of measuring them, I mean, even continuously, you don't need to. People haven't been that interested in, in M stars until very, very recently, right? Like in the last 10, 15, 20 years, and at least not deeply, the community I would say the broader exoplanet community has not been that interested in it because we've been looking at stars like our sun. So the first planet searches, right, were around sun-like stars. People were all focusing on sun-like stars for, you know, natural reasons, right? We know there are planets around sun-like stars. So let's go look there first. Um, but as we started finding more and more planets around M stars, people started getting more interested in it. So the answer is they probably do have cycles, but I can't tell you what they are. <laughs> Uh, the next question from our audience is, does Sparks have the capability to record spectra? And what are the challenges of putting Sparks on a CubeSat? Um, so Sparks will not do spectroscopy. UV scope will do spectroscopy. It's a bigger telescope. It's a bigger mission. Um, Sparks will monitor in just, just the far UV and just the near UV, but simultaneously. So we will get a color of the flare. We'll know if it's bluer or redder than some other flare. Um, so no, so that's, what was the second one? What are some of the challenges? Of putting sparks on a CubeSat. On a CubeSat, okay. Well, we're, we're, putting, we're, we're putting the payload into a CubeSat. So fitting everything into that tiny space that we have is definitely a challenge. You need to miniaturize everything, um, but that's okay. We know how to do it and we figure that out, how to fit it all in there. We also have to figure out how to fold the solar panels so they come out properly. Um, keep the temperature cool. So you have to fit, you know, you have to make sure that the temperature stays um, at what you need it to be within the allowable range. One of the challenges, in fact, though, is, um, is because as I said, you're hitchhiking a ride, you're riding as what we call as a secondary payload. Um, it doesn't mean you're not, it means that you're not totally in control of where you get dropped off. <laughs> right, so um, so even though what might be best for the science is a sun synchronous orbit, so we can always stare at our, at our target without too many interruptions by the Earth, it may be that no rocket is going in that location when we're ready to go. So we're just going to hitchhike to wherever it's going, and you know it might not be the most optimal orbit. But we wouldn't take an orbit that that would preclude us from doing our science. Of course, the science is top priority. So we have to make sure that we also have to be flexible at the same time. Yeah. Well, on that note, the next question was actually, will sparks observe other objects besides M dwarfs, I guess? Right. Well, hopefully, here's the plan. The plan is to spend one year doing our primary science, which is looking at the M stars. And then, you know, if it's still working after one year, you know, we'd be open to pointing it at other stars or galaxies of interest. Um, and I did mention in my talk that we do have a large field of view that could have tens or hundreds of other objects that people might be interested in monitoring. So what we will do is we will, we will prior to launch, um, publish all our fields and all the objects in them, and people can choose what objects they may want to observe. And we can downlink those postage stamps for them, and they could have that, those data. Cool. Um, let's see. The next question from our audience is, could you please explain how the spectra is measured as the planet transits? And related to that, they'd like to know, do you measure emission or absorption spectra? Mm, so fun. Um, 
So let's see. The first question, when you, when you are observing the spectrum, it's as if what, what you're observing, and it kind of is related to one of the questions earlier, um, what you're observing is as the planet occults the star, gets in front of the star, right? It is blocking out some of the starlight, but also the absorption, let's talk about absorption first, the absorption features um, are also imprinted there. So you are recording the stellar light plus the absorbed, um, the absorbed photons from the planet's atmosphere. And the actual measurement you get is the ratio of the two fluxes. Now, with regards to emission, now with emission, that's extra fun because you don't need to even be transiting, really. You could measure emission spectra from non-transiting planets, um, which people have done. And, um, and, that's, and that's really great and exciting, I think, pursuit as well. I also have a program looking for aurorae on exoplanets through emission. So it's not really transmission spectroscopy, it's planet spectroscopy but you have to deal with this giant bright star in the way. <laughs> um, well, so also related to that, the next question is, what was the rationale for picking the two spectral ranges and which molecular species are you targeting? Excellent, okay. I'll answer that for sparks first. For sparks in the near UV has some really nice strong emission lines that come from um, the uppermost regions of the stellar atmosphere. So they're very sensitive to flares. Um, and the near UV has a lot of stellar continuum and also a very strong magnesium emission line there in the M stars. So we're trying, we're, we, we picked them because those are the most sensitive regions for flares. Like I said, that we do see flares in optical, right? Lots, there's lots of flares that we see in optical photometry from Kepler, from tests, from ground-based observing. Um, but more and more data is now indicating that most of the flare energy is coming out in the UV and that there are sometimes flares in the UV that are never detected in the optical. So we're actually missing really important information, important energy and important physics. Um, the reason why UV scope has those ranges, has that wavelength range is for um, kind of similar reasons for the star, but for the planet, it's very different. So if the planet is losing mass, the strongest signature for mass loss is the hydrogen, right? Most of the atmosphere is hydrogen. So if the star, if the planet, excuse me, I'm gonna confuse everyone now. If the planet is losing a bunch of gas, most of it will be hydrogen. And that is measured with Lyman alpha, which is a transition of hydrogen. And that's in the ultraviolet, in the far ultraviolet. So that, that kind of sets a lower bound to our wavelength. And then there's a bunch of interesting metals that we might also, that we're also looking for as they're being lost. Um, when we're doing transmission spectroscopy, looking say at a hot Jupiter, there's um, silicon oxides that happen in the far UV and in the near UV and um, NCO, carbon monoxide. So there's different transitions. So it's all about it's all about where are the transitions of the molecules you're most interested in. Eugenia, are those real metals or astronomer defined <laughs> metals? Um, astronomy metals, some iron. You'd call iron a real metal, right? <laughs> Even astronomers, we were, yeah. So there's, there's, there's both to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just messing with you, I'm an astronomer. That's so. a good question. You're totally right because because that was that was jargony of me. My apologies. <laughs> um, oh, the next question is a really good one. It's why can we not monitor UV signals from here on Earth? Why do we have to go to space for it? Mm. Well, for the same reason that the UV. Um, for, it's for the same reason that the UV is so interesting for exoplanets because the atmospheres absorb the UV radiation. So that also happens on Earth. So here on Earth, our atmosphere is absorbing all the sunlight, right? And the UV radiation from other stars. And so by the time, so it just doesn't get down to the ground, right? I mean, some of the UV, like, you know, the, ray, the, the, the very, very near UV ones where that forces us to put sunscreen on, you know, they say UVB, UVC, those kinds of designations. So some UV light does come and it does damage our skin. And thankfully the atmosphere protects us from the really bad stuff. Um, but it also means that we can't observe it. So you could have life on earth or you could have ground-based telescopes. You know, it's really, 
like grandma's UV telescopes for your choice. Um, the next question on that note is, what is the significance of a telescope's size? How do the specifications for SPARKS broadly compare to other missions like, let's say, Hubble or James Webb? Okay, so SPARKS is teeny tiny. It's like this big. Um, it's nine centimeters in diameter. Um, so it's very small. Compared to Galax, it's 50, and Galax is 50 centimeters. Hubble is, I believe, 2.4 meters. So it's much bigger. So if you consider them like a light bucket, which is a term we use often in astronomy, the smaller you are, the fewer photons you're gonna collect. You're just not gonna be as sensitive. Right, which is one reason why astrophysics CubeSats are kind of late to the CubeSat game. Right, CubeSats have been observing the sun and the earth for longer. But in astrophysics, our objects are much farther away, they're fainter, so it's harder to do in a small telescope. Although there has been great success with other small telescopes, both from the ground and on space. Um, and so it's not, a, it's not a sensitive bottom line, but with new detectors where you have new technologies, they actually can buy back some of the loss of real estate in a tiny telescope. Um, you can buy back with a very sensitive detector. And also, even though we may not be um, ever as sensitive as Hubble, um, we do have the, 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 we do have the time coverage. And there's, you know, astrophysics, astronomy, like it's a very dynamic science, right? Like things are changing on tiny time scales and long time scales. And there's a lot of science to be done with just staring at something and figuring out what's going on in the time domain. Yeah, so I think we have time just for one last question. And this last question is, have you ever observed an exomoon around an exoplanet? No. <laughs> um, that's very easy. I've never observed it. I personally certainly haven't, and I don't think um, anyone else has either. There have been um, potential indications of moons discovered with, uh, with HST. I would encourage you to look up some papers there. I don't think they've been confirmed yet, but we are, you know, people are looking. They should be there, right? I mean, with our, we have so many moons in our own solar system that there's no reason why moons wouldn't form also around exoplanetary systems, but we have not yet confirmed them. Super, well, thank you. Thanks everyone yeah. for coming.